welcome to the Charles River Conservancy Parkland show. My name is Renata von Schorner. I'm the president and founder of the Charles River Conservancy. And we're going to talk about the bridges across the Charles and particularly the bridges that are going to be restored at the Anderson Bridge, the River Street Bridge and the Western Avenue Bridge and what is the best way to really improve them as those bridges are being restored and that work will not be done for another two or three generations so we want to really think hard of how that can be done best. And I have with me here Ken Krokemeyer. Welcome Ken. Thanks. Thanks Renata. Um, Ken has played a key role in the issues forum we had in December when former Governor Mike Dukakis moderated an issues forum mm -hmm. and you gave a very powerful presentation and we will have the benefit of seeing um, th this presentation here today on CCTV. Here we go again. Yeah, so <laughs> we had some 35 stakeholders um, talking about the bridges, the bridge renovations and Ken provided a very important historic overview. And Ken is a, both an architect and a transportation strategist. He has taught for 15 years at MIT. He now runs a program called Cities in the 21st Century. And he is a board member of Livable Streets. So I'll give it to you and um, Ken to kind of take us through though, that issue of bridges, bridge renovation and underpasses and connectivity along the Charles. Okay, thanks Renata. Uh, the way I'd like to start is to get you in the audience to start thinking a little bit about yourself and how you use the Charles River, how you may go across the bridges or under the bridges if you're on the water or along and to the bridges if you are running along the Charles or riding your bicycle or uh, just out for a stroll. Uh, if you're driving along the edge of the Charles, each of your experiences is a, is a bit different, but it is pretty much in the present. It's what happens that particular day as the sun's coming up or uh, just what it is that you're thinking at that moment and how you're feeling at that moment. But it hasn't always been exactly the way that you think it is today. And so in thinking about the way the bridges might be in the future, I think it's very helpful to think a little bit about the past. So we'll move to the past. This is where we are today. And um and we'll see uh, another slide here that looks uh, 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 the way that Charles looks. Um, I think you're going to get one more. Um, today, if we're up in the air, looking from on top of, say, Mount Auburn Cemetery and looking down toward downtown Boston. My father first came to Boston in 1909. And at that time, the Charles River was still tidal. It went up and down twice a day. It was a mudflat out there. And uh, most of his knowledge of the Charles River was as a rather pristine body of water that was dammed up in 1910 to be the basin that we know it today, but it was more bucolic along the edges because there were parklands along both sides. I came here first in 1951 when, yes, it was still the same tidal basin, but the Starrow Drive was just constructed. And so my experience along this basin has been one where highways have dominated the edges, Memorial Drive, Starrow Drive, of the Charles Basin and the Charles River. Today it's um, now 60 years later than that. And there is talk about how the Charles should evolve for the next century. What are the things that these bridges can do to make the Charles River the joy that it really should be? And there are a lot of people that are working on this, this vision. The Esplanade Association has developed a 2020 plan. There are a lot of people who are trying to put some attention to this. And so the work that Renata is doing is something that is trying to think about the bridges specifically and their role in how we cross the Charles, how we move along the Charles, whether it's underneath them in, on the water or whether it is along them and possibly under them if you are on the surface. So let's take a look at some of the history so that we can get a better sense. This is a model that was manufactured in 1900 for the Paris Exposition, looking from where as if we are flying over Boston itself, looking toward Harvard University and the Cambridge side up at the top of the slide. 
and you can see that where Harvard Stadium is, that darker green patch there, uh, just on this side of the river, next to where the Anderson Bridge is, um, River Street and Western Avenue bridges are there in place, but really all of Alston is um, what was once Tidal Flats and uh, farmland. It's a bit different today, to be sure. Let's go to the next slide where we can look downriver, uh, or we are downriver at Arlington and, and uh, what you see there as Back Street, and there's no Starro Drive. From 1900 to 1950, there was no Starro Drive here. There was the Esplanade and the legacy of the parks that were first funded by the, the Starro Fund. Um, and so this is the kind of, of uh, tidal basin uh, that my father first saw when he was here, um, when he was here in Boston. Um, Upriver, in the next slide, you'll see that uh, the area that is now Herder Park was a speedway. It was used by horses and carriages, if you can see in the slide on the bottom left. Uh, people went out for a Sunday uh, ride and there were races and in fact the details up in the plan above if we go to the next slide show the layout of not only the speedway 50 feet wide but the bicycle paths that were 20 feet wide each way with a loop at either end so people could do bicycle uh, circuits and um, so this is uh, 1894 and it lasted until the 1950s things that we've really quite forgotten so today. that means that means that the, the bike path was much wider and much more emphasis on, on bicycling and recreation. So there's definitely a, a heritage or a legacy we, we can build upon. Than anything people can seem to even imagine today. Yes. And let's go downriver to MIT and see a plan that Arthur Shercliffe did of how MIT as it was built uh, starting this is 1916 if I remember correctly how it might have engaged the river differently if there had been more filling into the water and if there was a walkway going underneath the Harvard Bridge uh, where Mass Avenue crosses over the Charles Basin and uh, you see a little entry even of water going into the great court of MIT. But it, the reason I put this slide in is to show how important the connection of people to the water is and how the Charles River really is a wonderful resource in terms of the water experience, the movement along the, um, the river itself yeah. along the shore, as well as the importance of crossing and in fact even automobiles um, along the parkways that were built at that time. Next. And it's also interesting to see that Shercliffe was at the same time thinking more about the crossings and how they might be located differently. If you can take a look at this slide and see the bridges that are marked in red that never were built, um, there, in addition to the Mass Avenue Bridge, the Harvard Bridge uh, that cuts across the main part of the basin, he was proposing another bridge, uh, Dartmouth Street, that would go across the basin as well, uh, ending up um, near uh, Kendall Square and still another one closer to the Fenway and uh, Boston University and then still another one between the BU Bridge and uh, River Street. So the idea that what we have now is absolutely fixed, we can't have more, we can't have less, is perhaps a challenge for us if we think about how the city might change over the next hundred years. And if we look back on how it has and has not changed over the past hundred years. So we're putting ourselves in a place today to think about what these bridges might do. Next. Even there was a bridge proposed uh, right where Boston University is just so that you had a spot as you look toward the State House because you would not be able from the BU Bridge to see the State House silhouetted against the Boston skyline, against the, uh, against the sky actually. Um, and so a bridge was proposed specifically for the idea that, well, we'll get a better view here of downtown Boston and it would start to make different kinds of connections. 
So now I think that we think a little bit more about history and we look at bridges that did cross the Charles. Uh, this is the Anderson Bridge in 1907 from, you see the Harvard Boathouse on the shore side, on the uh, near side. Harvard Square is right behind us and we're looking over toward Alston. And there were even, there was enough shipping so that there was an opening span of this bridge at the time to let ships go up and down. You can see both of the Harvard boathouses for uh, recreational boating. Next. And we look at the current bridge built just before 1920 and get a chance to see how its connection of Harvard over to the brand new stadium that you see in the in the foreground of the photograph. Now, um, so you now going to kind of take this historic information and kind of bring us to to the contemporary situation um, of renovation that need to be done and that is happening. Yep. So let's try to do that and let's take a little bit of a look at some of the existing bridges. This is the Weeks Bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge but is it's really the iconic arched bridge going across uh, the Charles River and visually it is epitomizes the kind of delight of a leap across that river. Next. Um, the Longfellow, uh, no longer a delight at the moment because it needs a great deal of repair, but it's getting that repair. And it will return to the visual delight that it deserves to be going across the Charles River. The next bridge that we'll see is the Land Boulevard crossing the Lechmere Canal down near the Cambridge Side Galleria it's less of a delight because in fact hiding behind the granite here is a standard green steel bridge uh, of a standard highway structure. So the arch isn't doing any work here and it doesn't give us the sense of leaping from one side to the other <laughs> at all. But it has begun the process of thinking about how one might get under the bridge. Admittedly this is not a very gracious passing underneath a bridge but it does have a bike lane walking path along the Charles uh, here Leachmere Canal that gets you underneath the bridge. So that's an important thing that is happening in this particular case. Next. Um, but to go back to delight, take a look at this bridge along the Seine in Paris and the idea as they do in Paris uh, during the summer of eliminating cars altogether and using that arch and that roadway as something that can be a place for cyclists to get out along the edge of the water. Next. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to take us now um, to to the, the, the situation we are um, want to address of the connectivity along the, the river of how pedestrians and bike bicyclists move along the river and the conflict with the people who come across the river, being it buses, cars, and again, bicyclists um, and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. So we have this map here um, of, the, of what is already existing. We're going to take a look now more specifically at three bridges. We're going to look at the Anderson Bridge, the one that's connecting Harvard Square over to, say, the Harvard stadium and the athletic fields and the uh, business school and we'll look at Western Avenue connecting Central Square over into Alston and we'll look at um, River Street which is also connecting Central Square or really going the opposite direction coming from um, Alston into Central Square and of course thinking about the parallel paths that are going along the edge of the river on both sides that are for walking or cycling or rollerblading or whatever else might be happening. And it might be useful to note that between the Anderson Bridge and the Elliott Bridge and along up to Western Avenue that section of Memorial Drive gets closed on Sundays during the summer on Sunday afternoons so that people can use the roadway there for purposes other than driving, uh, for bicycling, for walking, for being out in a wheelchair without the complication of cars. And so the kinds of uses that may ultimately evolve along uh, both Starro Drive and Memorial Drive for that whole stretch along the parkway, along the riverway, 
might be something that could be very different over the next hundred years than what we have known over the past 60, let's say. Mm -hmm. So we'll now move to the first of those bridges, the Anderson Bridge. We'll only uh, mention these because there are more details that are available about the, the intersections there, the possibilities of putting an underpass in underneath uh, the bridge at it, as it is rebuilt that would allow continuity to happen from uh, one side of the roadway to the other by going underneath it along the edge of the river itself. Um, something that would make the linear experience as opposed to the crossing experience a very different and much more pleasurable one for people on a bicycle or rollerblade or walking whether they are commuting for um, getting from home to work or whether they're out for a recreational ride or walk or just a peaceful uh, moment to be along the river. So let's go take a look at Anderson and then we'll look next at Western Avenue. Here the challenges are different, uh, different in every case. Where um, Soldier Seal Road, the extension of Star Drive is on the left hand side in this particular case and Memorial Drive is on the right. Uh, you're coming Western Avenue from Central Square. How do you use that today? Do you go across that bridge? If so, do you think about the river? Can you see the river? There's a very high parapet, a solid parapet that prevents people from looking down to the water. Uh, it did so in days when that water was not so wonderful because of the stockyards up in Alston. Um, but today the river is a delight and it's something that we would like to pay attention to as we go over. It would give us a greater chance to really take advantage of the special place that is created there. So let's look again now at uh, River Street and the challenges there, not so dissimilar to Western Avenue. And the complexity though of very tight geometries and how one would make the underpasses work, perhaps a, a uh, bikeway rolling water uh, walkway that goes out over the river, let's say on the left hand side of this slide, would cut underneath the river street and then come out on dry land on, on the area beyond that along the edge of Soldiers Field Road, for instance. These are all details that people are working on and trying to think about and trying to figure out how to actually do in an appropriate way so that they could better serve the linear movements and the cross movements at the same time while these bridges are being reconstructed. Every single one of them needs to be rebuilt in order to remain safe for the next hundred years. So um, we looked at the bridges of, of renovating them. Uh, I think the, the technical term is renovate, although it will be quite a substantial renovation. Um, but very much part of that process is that there'll be a long construction period mm -hmm. that we've all experienced with the BU bridge. And I think this is something that your strategy includes of to think about the management of that construction period and how that could be done in a creative way so that there is the least possible disruption for the people who actually need to cross the river. Construction is not fun. Um, and we're used to using our bridges, our roadways, just the way they are. But when they start to fall down, then something needs to be done. This is a picture of uh, Massachusetts Avenue right uh, at the bridge that crosses over the underpass of Memorial Drive, where over a two-year period, traffic was shuttled one lane over to one side, then to the other side. Uh, it re-emphasizes the importance of trying to figure out how to do this sort of thing with a bit of grace so that it doesn't create absolute havoc. The next slide I think is worth looking at All because... Right. I will. I just need to interrupt you a little ah, bit we're because... Not, we don't have it in there. Oh. Are we, because <laughs> we will be... We, will be um, we have a few more minutes so you'll have more images, but in case you just joined the show, um, this is the Charles River Conservancy Parkland Show and you can actually um, get that show on YouTube and if you go to the website thecharles.org where you can also find information about the bridges, the renovation, the advocacy for underpasses. Um, so this is a, a, your chance to, to go there and find that information. But we're now moving on um, in some other images 
that pertain to um, looking at the underpasses and that connectivity. Here, this slide of Harvard Bridge going across toward MIT from Boston shows that we've got cyclists on the sidewalk, we've got bicycles in the bike lane, but it shows the difficulty of trying to get everything to work for every person in a way that is appropriate. Those cycles on the, on the sidewalk are a hazard to the folks who are trying to walk or even the folks who are trying to jog there. But we don't have access down to the, the park uh, parkland underneath on both sides. So if someone's coming from Cambridge, they're going to want to be on that sidewalk just so that they can use the ramp to get down to the esplanade. How could we solve that? It requires some building. It requires uh, a ramp on the other side of the roadway, or maybe we could slow the cars down uh, sufficiently, or perhaps use the same strategy as on the BU bridge, where there's one lane off and two lane and one lane on and two lanes off. If we did that in both directions, the bike lane could be much wider. Could yeah. even be done structured in a way that it could be safe to go both ways. Yeah. So. There are all kinds of ways we can start to think about the infrastructure that we have and how we make small changes in it to make it start working more effectively for people in all walks of life, in all ways of getting around, all different kinds mm -hmm. of modes. And actually the, the BU bridge, which was in the press recently, I think has improved in terms of crossing, but there's still no way on the Boston side to get from the BU bridge to the parklands. Right, lands. right. You have to go uh, several hundred yards down river to take a pedestrian bridge and um, on the Cambridge side there could have been an underpass there was the space there so there are there are some lessons to be learned from from the BU bridge and we want to make sure we apply those to the other bridges. Lessons to be learned everywhere and I think that's part of where each of you come in if you think about how you're using things and how it might work differently for you then there's ways that you can get involved through the Conservancy, through livable streets, through different organizations, your own neighborhood organization, to try to figure out how to get each of the things that need to be redone, your own street, these bridges, redone in a way that makes it really work for you. We don't have to live with what we've got for the next hundred years, no. just because that's what we've got today. So you have some other images here. Um, would you like me to go back to the image beforehand? I think we're okay here. Okay. Um, this is Berlin, a, ridge, a, a roadway um, bridge, but one with a sidewalk that is wide enough for bikes to be parked there and still people to walk. Let's go to the next one. And we can see uh, Rotterdam, where there's a very separate place to walk, a place for bicycles and a place for cars. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking about the different modes and making the appropriate accommodations so that they're all safe and so that people have the joy of being able to stand there on the bridge and look out without feeling like they're going to get wiped out by either a bicycle or a car, uh, are things that we have a responsibility to deal with when we, when we rebuild our infrastructure. Well, you, you have now some images um, of, of, a, of a wonderful event, Hub on Wheels, um, that really um, opens up all kinds of perspectives. Uh, I remember when I first participated um, the, the joy of being able to ride on, on Storo Drive was just ex exhilarating. And it happens one time a year, one time a yeah. year. But we close down Storo for 4th of July. Maybe we should be doing this every Sunday. And maybe our appreciation of the Charles, as well as our use of that asphalt for a whole series of different kinds of modes, might make the people in wheelchairs out there to be safe, uh, folks to be able to rollerblade, um, and maybe that happens at a time of day when it's not hectically used by automobiles for, tra for uh, very uh, important commuting movements, at least for the next some years until those moves are taken care of more easily by, um, by transit or by living, working at home. Mm -hmm. But for the time being, we can make changes that are temporal changes that allow our infrastructure to do lots of different work at different times of day. I think the final slide probably shows the kind of exhilaration that can happen <laughs> when you're out for a ride on Star Drive, uh, something that does happen now with Hub on Wheels once a year, but it's something that I think uh, we should learn from places like Bogota, Colombia, that do this once a week in Ciclovia. Mm -hmm. Well, can I 
want to thank you for, for coming to talk about that. And as I mentioned, you can get that on YouTube and Livable Streets, where Ken is on the board, works hard on that. We work together also with Walk Boston, Mass Bike, and um, try to get all those stakeholders involved. So thank you very much, Ken, for um, being here today and for working on that, your vision of and your knowledge of other examples around the world is, is very important. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome, Renata. This is fun. Good. All right. Well, we hope to make those bridges better for the future and for all of us. So let us know your views and you can, um, you can get in touch with us at the Charles River Conservancy. Thank you.